episode, and I'm thrilled to have back with me today, Carter Keating. Carter, first of all, welcome back. Thank you for having me. Carter, I wanted to ask you to come back on the pod to talk to us about the just concluded, a recently concluded legislative session, your thoughts from the perspective of agriculture in Texas, and ask what we might do in the interim uh, before the next legislative session. But before we get started, can you remind our listeners your current role? Yes, sir. So uh, my name is Carter Keating. I am the founder and executive director of Texas Agriculture Connection, which is a nonprofit advocacy organization. We educate the general Texas public about the importance of Texas agriculture and the gravity of the challenges that the industry is facing. We do that primarily on social media, and we advocate for legislative solutions at the state level to address some of those challenges. So how would you assess the most recently concluded legislative session from your perspective, Carter? So we just wrapped up the 88th Texas legislature's regular session, and I I am pleased with how the session went from an agriculture perspective. We had four legislative priorities this past session, the right to farm, broadband infrastructure, water infrastructure, and young farmer funding and support. And in all four, we accomplished something. In three of those priorities, we got some major legislation passed. And so from my perspective, the legislation was a very productive one, and I'm pleased with how everything shook out over the past six months. How would you assess the reception you received with your new position and your advocacy for the Texas farmer, both from the farmer and the legislator perspective? That's a great question. We, the organization officially got off the ground in October of last year. So we're a fairly new organization. And I think it's a testament to the legislators that are involved in agricultural issues and a testament to those already in the sphere, how quickly we were able to jump in and offer our perspective, our input and have conversations about some of these issues with both legislators and some of the organizations that have been working on these issues for a number of sessions, for a number of years. Fortunately, this past year, we were able to work on many of these issues, and I'm grateful to the, I'm grateful for the reception that we received as an organization. So let's get into the three initiatives that you felt like you got some real push on and some success. So could you go through each one of those for us? Yes, sir. I'll start with the right to farm. To give you a little bit of background, in 1981, Texas enacted the original right to farm statute. That came out of a desire to protect our state's most productive agricultural land from urban sprawl and to ensure that Texans would continue to have access to safe and affordable food into the future. That protected agricultural operations within municipalities from regulation that would disrupt their agricultural practice. So if I'm a farmer or rancher just outside of a city and that city grows to encompass me, I can continue to run my agricultural operation as I have unencumbered by regulations that would stop me from doing that. Since 1981, it's been 42 years and some municipalities have gotten a little a little heavy handed with how they have regulated agricultural land. There are also some generally accepted agricultural practices that weren't covered in the 1981 statute. Farmers have faced everything from destruction of property to thousands of dollars in fines. And so at the beginning of the session, it was clear that this was going to be a big issue that the legislature would need to deal with. This session, we passed two bills related to the right to farm and one proposed constitutional amendment. House Bill 1750 strengthened the existing right to farm statute. It added agricultural practices to the list of protected agricultural practices within municipalities, and it put the onus on the municipality, the regulating entity, to demonstrate a need for that regulation in an effort to protect the public health. So you you couldn't have a municipality or a city, county government imposing a regulation without needing to, without demonstrating a need to do that regulation in an effort to protect the public health. House Bill 2308 apply some of those same protections to agricultural operations, but those that are located outside of municipalities. And it protects those operations from nuisance action and other forms of lawsuit. So again, it requires the filer of the lawsuit against the agricultural operation to demonstrate that operation 
needs to be regulated in an effort to protect the public from imminent danger, protect the public health, those sorts of things. And then we've got the crown jewel of right to farm legislation that was passed this session, HJR 126, which is the proposed constitutional amendment to enshrine the right to farm into the Texas constitution. So it's very simply written. The people of Texas have the right to engage in farming, ranching, and a litany of other agricultural practices on land that they lease or own. It's very responsibly written. It recognizes the authority of the state to regulate agricultural practices, to protect the public health, to protect animal health, natural resources, crop production. Uh, and you know, it also gives the people of Texas an opportunity to express their support for the right to farm. That election, the Texas constitutional election, which I'll continue to talk about a few other constitutional amendments, but that'll take place on November 7th of this year. And I'd encourage everyone listening to mark their calendars and make sure that they get out to, to vote in support of Texas agriculture on November 7th and early voting as well. The second issue that, that I'll touch on is water infrastructure. You know, last time I was on the Hill Country podcast, I talked about the need for repair and investment in Texas's water infrastructure. Last year, we had 3,000 boil water notices, and many of those were concentrated in East Texas and our state's rural communities. And coming to this session, any Texas legislative session these days, you can expect water to be a big issue. And this year, with Senate Bill 28, which was passed this past session, you had the establishment of the New Water Supply for Texas Fund, which is a, a fund to finance water supply projects to develop 7 million acre feet of new water supplies over the next 10 years for Texas. Think desalination pro projects, aquifer storage and recovery, those types of projects. 7 million acre feet, what does that really mean? one acre foot is equivalent to about 326,000 gallons of water. So when we talk about 7 million acre feet annually over the next 10 years, we're talking about a lot of water. So that's a very important investment. As we get more and more people moving to Texas, we need to ensure that those people have access to clean water. And so that, that's a great investment. And Senate Bill 28 also establishes the Texas Water Fund, which is a special fund outside the general revenue fund that deals with that infrastructure issue. And it provides funding for a repair and replacement of water infrastructure. It provides funding for awareness programs about the water issues in Texas. And it specifically targets that funding towards rural political subdivisions, low population areas, which are often those that, that need that funding most. There, there's a constitutional amendment that goes along with Senate Bill 28, and that's SJR 75. Anytime you have a special fund outside the general revenue fund, that needs to be uh, authorized by Texas voters through a proposed Texas constitutional amendment. So SJR 75 is the constitutional amendment that Texans can vote on November 7th to authorize the Texas Water Fund, that infrastructure piece. The next issue is broadband infrastructure. In Texas, there are 7 million people 7 million Texans across 3 million households that lack quality high-speed broadband internet access. Evidence suggests that broadband access improves education access, it improves healthcare outcomes, and it makes businesses more competitive, provides them access to new markets. And so this broadband infrastructure access is very important for the educational healthcare and economic needs of and future of Texas. House Bill 9, which was passed this legislative session, establishes the Broadband Infrastructure Fund. The legislature appropriated $1.5 billion for this Broadband Infrastructure Fund, and that will go towards financing and funding the development and the operation of broadband infrastructure here in Texas. That, again, is a special revenue fund outside, or a special fund outside the general revenue fund. And so we have HJR 125, which will you know, provide, again, Texans the opportunity to voice their support for these investments and uh, officially establish the Texas Broadband Fund. You know, a, a final point I'll add on broadband, House Bill 9 made use of some very smart fiscal policy because you know, it will put up, if passed, it will put up matching funds to get 
access to federal resources that are available for Texas to develop and operate broadband infrastructure. House Bill 9 helps the Texas dollar, the Texas taxpayer dollar go a little bit far, further in you know, establishing needed investments in, in Texas broadband. You mentioned there was one piece, one priority rather, that you got some traction on and some results, but perhaps not as much as you want. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Sure. So that is that was our priority, young farmer funding and support. The average age of the Texas farmer is right around 60 years old. And if we know that we want to have the next generation of Texas producers ready to take up the mantle of Texas agriculture when those farmers are ready to retire. And so it's important that we're cultivating that next generation of Texas producers. And House Bill 2851, this session was a bill we were very excited about. Uh, it, you, there's an existing Young Farmer Grant Program within the Texas Department of Agriculture. That program provides a, a matching grant to young producers that apply for it that are under the age of 46 uh, to put those resources towards their agricultural operation. House Bill 2851 would increase the maximum size of a grant under the Young Farmer Grant Program from $20,000 to $35,000, keeping up with increases in, in input costs and the high you know, capital necessary to start an agricultural business. That bill passed through the Texas House. We didn't get it all the way through the Texas Senate. So that's certainly a, an issue that we'll be looking at as we approach the 89th Texas legislature's regular session. But it wasn't a wholesale loss with regard to that priority because House Bill 1, the general appropriations bill that funds all of these funds, directly appropriated $500,000 to the Young Farmer Grant Program over the next two years. It's my understanding that's the first time that the Young Farmer Grant Program has received a direct appropriation. I'm excited about it because I think that appropriation is a result of the increased attention that this issue got during the legislative session. And it means that there's $500,000 out there in grants for young farmers and young producers under the age of 46 to get out there and apply for. It. If there are listeners out there that, that are, would fall in that category of a young producer, or if you know of any young producers that might be able to take advantage of that program, I would highly suggest you visit the Texas Department of Agriculture's website and that Young Farmer Grant Program and apply this fall. So it sounds like we all have some immediate work to do aiming towards the general election in November. You've touched on these a little bit, but could you maybe explain the constitutional amendment process in Texas as you understand it for people like us, the voters? Yes, sir. The After the legislature, there is an election where all eligible Texas voters can vote on the proposed constitutional amendment that the legislature passed uh, in the previous se session. And this year, that will take place on November 7th with early voting starting in late October. And there will be 14 proposed constitutional amendments. You'll, you'll go to the ballot box and you'll have the opportunity to vote yes or no on those 14 proposed amendments. I mentioned three, HJR 126, HJR 125, and SJR 75, TAC, Texas Agriculture Connection, and myself are in support voting yes on all three of those proposed constitutional amendments. And eventually, at some point prior to the November 7th election, they will all get prop numbers. So prop one through 14. And so you can follow Texas Agriculture Connection social media, and we'll be ready to keep you updated as soon as those prop numbers come out so that you are equipped with all the information you need to make an educated vote. Carter, looking down the road to the 89th legislative session, can you tell us either some of the, you told us about the Young Farmers Fund, but are there any other initiatives that are in the wind or you're thinking about? Or are you going to assess your constituency and see what might be the most help for them? Or what can we do to prepare for that session? Yes, sir. I mentioned the Young Farmer Funding and Support issue. That's certainly something that we're going to be paying attention to. There are 18 months between the end of one regular session and the start of the next regular session, which is a long time, but it's a great opportunity for myself, Texas Agriculture Connection, and other organizations to take a step back from the legislative process and to hear from uh, the, the farmers and ranchers that are dealing with some of these issues day in and day out. 
And that's certainly something that we, that's going to be a focus for us over the next 18 months. We love to hear from uh, farmers and ranchers the issues that that they're that they care about and that they want to see addressed with the Texas legislature, and it's a huge part of how we develop our legislative priorities moving into the next session. And so, for us specifically, you can get on our website www.txagconnection.com and fill out a contact form. You can send us an email. We're really excited about spending the next 18 months hearing about what Texas farmers and ranchers are concerned about so that we can go back to the legislature in 18 months and hopefully address some of those issues. Are you going to be out on the road going visiting with groups and individual farmers literally in all 254 counties of the great state of Texas? That's the plan. We Texas is a big state. That's a lot of travel, but I've been in, in Austin the past year. I'm now here in Victoria, Texas, the Coastal Bend area, which is where I grew up. But we certainly have plans to go around the state and solicit the opinions of farmers and ranchers and other agricultural producers in the state of Texas. I'm working with Right to Farm Texas, which is an organization set up by Representative Dwayne Burns, who led the charge on the Right to Farm in an effort to raise support and awareness Uh, about the importance of HR 126 and the right to farm being enshrined in the Texas Constitution. And I'm hopeful that will, uh, again, give us an opportunity to travel across the state of Texas and hear from farmers and ranchers. You are absolutely correct to note the size of this state. Do the issues for farmers vary from region to region or are they consistent across the state? I think they're fairly consistent across the state. I'll take the right to farm issue as an example. You, it started, I think, it, the support for addressing this issue through the legislature started in the Northeast Texas area around the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. But then, as we start looking into this issue and the, the legislative solutions that are possible to address this issue, we start to find that you, not only is this an issue that's isolated to that part of Texas, but other counties across the state of Texas are also dealing with some of those similar issues. Water, broadband infrastructure, those are very important issues that span across the state of Texas. Certainly there are issues that maybe a farmer in a farmer rancher in Victoria County who has to deal with that somebody who further in West Texas maybe doesn't to the same degree and vice versa. But generally speaking, I think I've found that agricultural issues are agricultural issues, and they tend to be fairly consistent across the state of Texas. Carter, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time for this episode. You've told us the website, but if someone wanted to contact you for more information or really just to follow up on any of the topics you've touched on, what would be the best way for them to contact you? Feel free to send me an email. That would be Carter, C-A-R-T-E-R, at T-X-A-G-Connection.com. I'd love to hear from you and do whatever I can to help. Again, you can visit our website, follow us on social media. We'll continue to keep our followers up to date on agricultural issues, the Texas Constitutional Amendment election that's upcoming. And then if you're interested in that right to farm issue and would like to find out more about it and how you can help, I'd encourage you to visit wwwright farmtexascom and learn more about the issue and how you can get involved. Carter, as always, it's a pleasure and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for having me.